Hey everybody, it's your boy Sean Megami Tensei 5, back once again for the Renegade Master, and it's time for the video you've all been waiting for, Obscure and Forgotten PS1 Games, Volume Number 9. And if you've been waiting on a different video, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. You know the drill by now, we're gonna look at three games selected at random by our Lord and Saviour, Senor Wheel, and of course, one bonus game chosen by you, the lovely viewer. This is probably the longest episode of the series yet, and for good reason. So let's not waste any more time, you're here for the games, and as always, the wheel will provide. The wheel will provide. First up, we have everybody's favourite French-speaking cowboy, it's Lucky Luke, making his debut on the PlayStation in November of the year 1998, courtesy of Ocean and Infogrames. For those unaware, Lucky Luke is a very popular European comic book character, created by the Belgian cartoonist Morris in 1946. The series is both an homage and parody of classic American westerns, and like, other influential French language comics such as Tintin and Asterix and Obelix, the series was a massive success, going beyond its native France and Belgium, with the characters seeing long-lasting international success all across the globe to this very day. That means beyond the comics we have a ridiculous number of movies, both animated and live action, TV series, plenty of spin-offs and of course, a bunch of video games too. And while the character's history in video games dates all the way back to Tiger Electronic Devices in the early 80s, some home computer releases, and even what might be one of the best Philips CDI exclusives, today we're going to be taking a look at the character's debut in 3D, and if the back of the box is anything to go by, the first 3D cowboy game, uh, ever. You know, oddly enough, I think they might actually be telling the truth about that one. I, for the life of me, can't think of a polygonal 3D cowboy game that's come out prior to this game. If anybody knows of one, please let me know, and no, Mad Dog McCree isn't 3D. And no, this isn't a thinly veiled excuse for me to play Mad Dog McCree clips. Now before we dig in, I should also mention that Lucky Luke was somebody's selection on the viewer wheel, so today, we've got the very rare and illustrious default winner. So come on everybody, give it up for triples. What are the odds? Probably quite low I'd imagine, but either way, congrats. Default! 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 <laughs> So what type of game is Lucky Luke? I guess the easy answer is that it's a 2.5D action platformer. You got your running, you got your gunning, you got your jumping, and you got your, uh, punching. Although truthfully, I feel a more apt term to describe Lucky Luke is that it's a variety platformer. While there are plenty of levels that follow a basic gameplay blueprint, the goals and mechanics oftentimes switch from level to level. And sometimes that blueprint also gets thrown out the window and it can feel like we're playing an entirely different game. And while it's certainly not uncommon for video game platformers especially to mix things up gameplay and objective wise level to level, Lucky Luke does this pretty much the whole way through the game, making for quite a varied experience. But does all this experimentation end up being a good thing? Well, let's find out. So, Lucky Luke is pretty much your standard single player only experience. You play through a series of levels one by one until you reach the end of the game, all held together by a simple story, which boils down to bad guys escape from prison, so now it's up to you to catch them and send them back to prison. Outside of a few CGI cutscenes and some minor voiced in-game cutscenes, the story doesn't really aim to be anything more than a bit of fluff to keep the game moving from one scene to the next. As for the gameplay itself, well, 
as we mentioned, Lucky Luke tends to jump around from one style to the next quite regularly, but the majority of the time you will be playing the game in this traditional 2.5D style. The gameplay here is pretty much like any old platformer from the 80s and 90s. You've got a button to run, you can duck and jump, and you can also fire your six shooter in a variety of different directions around your character. Outside of that, you can also drop some dynamite, but these are limited and mostly are used to clear objects in your path and also gain access to bonus items. Speaking of items, the game does give you a variety of them to collect, the major one being these dollar signs, which can be used in a shop at the end of the level to either buy extra lives or you can spend a decent chunk to reveal a password so you can return later on. Oh yeah, this game doesn't have memory card saves by the way, so paying for the privilege of a password is the only option you've got. Or you could just check the internet, so plenty of lives it is. Rounding out the items, we have Sheriff Stars, which heal up Luke's health, denoted by the number of wooden boards behind the character's head in the top left. It was about half an hour into the game before I noticed this was the health bar, by the way. And finally, there's these bonus bees, which bring you to one of the game's three different bonus levels for the chance to earn even more money. But we'll get to those in a moment. Now, where Lucky Luke starts to get interesting is how it changes as the game goes on. The game's early levels often require nothing more than walking from left to right. You shoot a few enemies, you blow up a few objects, you do a bit of platforming. Nice and easy. But as the game goes on, you start noticing, hey, this level isn't letting me use my gun for some reason, or this level might be a giant maze full of different doors that spit you out somewhere completely new on the map, or it's now a big open level that requires you to find a certain number of items to progress. The platforming levels in Lucky Luke feel like a mishmash of various types of games from the 16-bit era. You've got your traditional linear platformer, your big maze-like platformer where you've got to hunt down a bunch of items, and sometimes it even feels a little bit like Sunset Riders as well, because why not? That game rules. But while these platforms Platforming levels take up the majority of the game's runtime. In between, you've also got levels where you'll be riding on a horse, jumping over hazards, or maybe you'll take on a lumberjack in a series of strongman contests. How about a saloon style fighting game, or even a Wild West rail shooter? No, not that one. The variety even extends over to the bonus games as well, with three in total ranging from even more shooting minigames to arm wrestling your horse or a game of cards. As you can see, Lucky Luke is very much a variety platformer, and at the very least, it's nice to be constantly getting these new gameplay elements to try out, whether it's changes to the structure of the platforming levels or just something brand new and out of left field. And while I think this is probably one of the game's strongest selling points, I think this is also where the game kinda drops the ball a little bit too. Lucky Luke is a game that I had a fun time with, but it's often a game of highs and lows. For every level that I enjoyed, there was often a level that I found kind of boring, confusing, or it just might have outright given me brain damage. This might just be down to personal taste, but the more linear platforming levels I had a fun time with. Tricky platforming, hazards, enemies to react to, that's my jam. On the other hand, big levels where you have to hunt down items separated by a maze of doors and insta-kill pits, that is not my jam. This is also compounded by Luke being a rather stiff character to control. He's certainly functional, but it's the kind of game where your speed and timing can easily lead to quick, easy deaths, so longer levels that require a lot of exploring and backtracking can become a bit taxing. And as the game goes on, it also relies on these type of levels more often, and they end up just kind of becoming a bit of a drag, really. You know when you're hoping for a level to end, something ain't right. Although at the very least, once you beat a level, you're usually guaranteed a nice palette cleanser, but unfortunately, these also vary a bit in quality too. While the horse level is pretty fun, the fighting and shooter levels unfortunately feel a bit half-baked for me, just a little too simple and brainless for my liking, and the others usually just involve button bashing, which, you know, is button bashing, so your mileage may vary. Although, we gotta talk about this minecart level specifically. Now, minecart levels, they're no stranger to video games, often with a reputation for being difficult. But I gotta say, this is by far the hardest minecart level I have ever experienced in a game. Up until this point, I thought I was being cheeky with my big pile of 20 lives. Why would I need more than 20 lives, I asked myself. How could I possibly die 20 times? Well, the answer to that question is the fucking minecart level. It's not just that you need incredibly fast reaction times. It's not just that you're up against a strict timer. It's not just that you have to remember where the switches are located. And it's not just that you need almost pixel perfect timing on some of these jumps. But you've got to dodge about 40 of these instant death hazards before you even see the first checkpoint for the level. Seriously, 
the combined difficulty of the entire rest of the game doesn't compare to this one level. It is wild. I should probably also mention these boss battles against the Dalton gang, but these are probably the least interesting part of the game really, but hey, they don't want to make you tear your hair out, so that's good. So yeah, Lucky Luke, kind of a mixed bag on the gameplay front, but how about the game's presentation? Well, as you can see, the game goes for a sort of 3D cel-shaded comic style for the characters and level geometry, but also mixes some flat 2D stuff for additional characters and objects as well. There doesn't seem to be much consistency to this, with enemies and characters jumping from 2D to 3D all the time, and while it certainly can look a bit rough and unpolished nowadays, I think it represents the source material quite well, and the bright colours used throughout the main game add a nice bit of charm. Although seriously, whoever thought it was a good idea to make the bullets and projectiles this tiny? How am I supposed to see these coming at me in environments? What is this? A bullet for ants? Speaking of the environments and locales, I quite like these as well. They cover pretty much all the western classics from saloons to mines, and even getting high with some Native Americans in the desert. You love to see it. Unfortunately, what you don't love to see is the game's inconsistent performance. Lucky Luke isn't exactly what I'd call a smooth experience from start to finish. Even when the game maintains a pretty consistent frame rate, it can just feel a little bit, I don't know, jittery, I guess is the right word to say. I don't know how well it comes across on screen, but it's something you just feel while playing. Thankfully, I didn't find that it impacted the gameplay too much, but it is definitely far from ideal. On the other hand, though, we have the game's sound, which... Well, sound effects wise is fine. Gunshots and general effects are nice, but lack the punchiness I would like from a Wild West game. And while the narrator's dialogue sounds good, all the in-game characters and enemies sound very, very odd. Oh, well. As for the music, well, how you feel about it is really going to come down to your personal taste on country music and blues. But for what it's worth, I don't think they really could have given this game a more fitting soundtrack when all is said and done. It's got really high quality recordings of various acoustic and electric guitar tracks that are relaxing, catchy, and are pure Americana. Definitely one of the game's highlights for sure. So when it all comes down to it, Lucky Luke's 11 levels won't take you much longer than 2 hours to beat, and after some highs and lows, once you eventually reach the credits, would I say it was worth it? Eh, uh, maybe. Truthfully for me, this is what I would consider a straight down the middle game, equal parts bad and equal parts good, although I think overall as a platformer on the console, it just doesn't play well enough nowadays to really make this one worth going out of your way to play, unless you just happen to really like western themed games or Lucky Luke. That being said though, this isn't the only Lucky Luke game on the console, as a PAL exclusive follow up titled Lucky Luke Western Fever did launch on the console in 2001, so maybe if the wheel is feeling lucky, we might get to check this one out down the line at some point too. Until then, at least I'll continue to have this game's catchy guitar tunes stuck in my head for a few more weeks at least, and that minecart level will probably haunt my nightmares for years to come, so that's nice. The wheel will provide.
intercepted localizer seven right. Radio altitude 800 feet, sync is seven contact center. Next, we got NGen Racing making its way to the PlayStation in the summer of the year 2000. And the NGen isn't just a fun pun on engine, it is also an abbreviation of the game's full title, which is Next Generation Racing. Now, we've covered a lot of racing games on the channel so far, and even some flying based games, but I think this is the first time we've covered an aerial racing game. Now, of course, aerial racing games aren't all that uncommon, whether you're doing a bit of flying and Diddy Kong racing, or maybe playing a little bit of Freaky Flyers. It's certainly not an unusual path for a racing game to take. Hell, even Banjo got his own flying kart racer on the GBA, which is actually kind of weird when you think about it. But in the pantheon of aerial racers, I can't say I've played one before that featured a focus on jet planes. And considering how fast these things go, it's quite impressive somebody tried to tackle this on the PS1, of all things. Now, if you're wondering how a game like this might work, well, I guess the easiest way to explain it is imagine Wipeout meets Ace Combat, and well, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And I'm not just mentioning Wipeout because it's a very fast racer on the PS1. It turns out this game was the debut release from British studio Curly Monsters, a team made up of ex-Signosis developers who had previously worked on the Wipeout series. Now, unfortunately, Curly Monsters would only ever make two games before shutting down, NGen Racing, of course, being their first, and their second was the Xbox exclusive Quantum Redshift, which definitely isn't just Wipeout on the Xbox. But let's ignore that for now because it's time to see how Curly Monster's first effort fares all these years later. Now normally when I talk about racing games, I usually run through the various modes first, but honestly this game has a surprisingly large amount of content, so it's probably just better to start with the flying and racing itself so we know what's happening. In Engine Racing, you will pilot one of a variety of different jet planes, from stealth bombers to fighter jets. If it's up in the air and it goes fast, well, you can probably fly it in this game. The races see you competing against up to five AI opponents in what feels like a pretty traditional racing track layout, but with the added caveat of being in the air, which definitely adds an extra dimension to things. You still hold X to propel yourself forward and square to brake like many other racing games, but the rest of the controls feel more similar to your standard flight game, with the ability to control your pitch, yaw and roll. It's something that may take a little while to get used to, but if you're familiar with flight games, it should come to you quite naturally. The remaining buttons are for boosting and weapons. Boosting is relatively straightforward, you'll see these rings on the track while flying. The orange ones fill your boost meter, which allows you to boost by pressing the circle button. And the green rings, these restore your health, which is very handy if you crash into mountains a lot like I do, or tend to get hit by missiles quite often. Speaking of missiles, each plane also comes equipped with four different weapons, all of which are accessible from the very start of the race. You got your infinite machine gun, and there's also limited weapons like rockets, homing missiles, and defensive flares, which if equipped, automatically launch if your jet is in danger. And as you can see, if you're ever in first place, these are very, very useful. So gameplay wise, it's kind of what you'd come to expect from both a racing game and flight game of the time. But of course, combining these two elements together and making it work, well, you'd need the control to be snappy and responsive, and the good news is that they've pretty much nailed it. So when you start the game, you have access to a brief tutorial which explains all of the game's controls and mechanics to you. Although, interestingly, the game gives you the option of two different control schemes, Arcade Mode and Pro Mode. Now, Arcade Mode is pretty much the option you want to go for if you're either a beginner or you just want to pick up and play the game. Turning functions like most racing games, and you can also use the rudders on the shoulder buttons to take tight turns, almost like a sky drift. It feels very nice, it's user friendly, and most importantly of all, it's fun to control. Now, the Pro Mode, on the other hand, eh, uh, well, let's just say the name is quite appropriate. This mode drastically changes how you're playing controls, and while I wouldn't exactly call it a simulation style mode, it's definitely closer to the real thing than Arcade, most notably allowing you the ability to fully control your plane's roles. Now, if you're wondering why somebody might pick the Pro Mode controls over the more simple Arcade method, well, outside of wanting to have a more realistic flight experience, 
There's also bonus mechanics that you can only do in pro mode, the most notable of which is flying through health and boost rings upside down to gain double the amount. This means if you're serious about the game and want to be as fast as you possibly can be, this is the way to play. Now I tried to learn pro mode, but holy shit, I was bad at it. Races I could destroy in arcade mode were a massive struggle in pro mode, so just for clarity, most of the gameplay you'll see today will be me using the arcade mode, which to its credit, didn't feel like an easy mode, nor did it feel like it limited me when I was winning any races, so either option is completely valid, it all just comes down to personal preference. And speaking of personal preference, the game also features four different viewpoints, two external views, and also a first person view with or without the cockpit, and truthfully, all four of the views I found worked quite well, there's definite benefits to each, and once again, it all comes down to personal preference, but thankfully no matter how you like to fly, the game delivers the goods. Also I suppose you may have noticed these lights across the game's environments, and as you may have guessed, these essentially represent the game's track layout. Make sure to stick inside these things and you really can't go wrong, but if you do fly out of them though, the game begins a 3 second countdown, and if this runs out, your plane enters an autopilot mode which thankfully resets you back on the track, but quite slowly. So naturally, you'd want to avoid this whenever possible. Throughout the tracks, you'll also come across these checkpoints too, which are arguably the most important aspect of the races, because if you miss two of these checkpoints, you immediately get disqualified, which as you can imagine, is very bad. Now you see, what actually makes this game kinda cool, and is in my opinion the game's strongest aspect, is how you can kinda play with the game's rules to create shortcuts and optimize your racing. You see, if you leave the track you get that 3 second countdown right, but let's say you leave the track and re-enter a different part of the track in 2.9 seconds, well then, nothing bad happens, and if you want, you can essentially abuse this to skip chunks of the race, saving you tons of time. Of course, what you can do is limited by how fast your plane can go, where do you have boost, and if there's a checkpoint coming up that you can't skip, but in many ways, it gives each track a huge amount of possible shortcuts that all feel very dynamic, making experimentation not only highly recommended, but really rewarding when you figure something out. Long story short, this game's pretty cool. So now that we've run through all of the core gameplay mechanics, now let's talk about the modes. So when you start the game, you'll have two different options on the menu, Arcade Mode and N-Gen Mode. Arcade Mode is where you can access things like two-player split-screen modes and the traditional championship mode that you'd expect from most racers. You select the championship, you do four races, and when you win, you unlock the next one. Now these four championships, Trainer, Fighter, S-Fighter, and X-Fighter, also represent the game's four speed classes. The higher you go, the faster your planes will go. Although interestingly, the trainer class also prevents you from using weapons, which I think is a nice way to get people familiar with the flying controls, since using weapons while flying at high speeds definitely takes a bit more getting used to compared to other racing games. Also to balance out the increased speed, each class ups the number of laps you'll need to complete on each track. Trainer is 3 laps, Fighter is 5 laps, S Fighter is 7, and X Fighter is 9. This may seem like a lot, but I really need to stress, you go very, very fast, so it really is for balancing more than anything. Now while the arcade mode has a lot to do and acts as a nice introduction to the game and its tracks, beating it fully, uh, unlocks nothing, so you can almost entirely skip it if you want. This brings us to the game's major single player component, N-Gen mode. Now remember when I said this game has a lot of content, this mode is pretty much what I'm talking about. Here you're tasked with buying your own plane from a huge selection, entering it into races and championships, earning more cash so you can buy various upgrades and cosmetic changes so you can win more races, so you can then afford planes of a better class, which will then allow you to enter into more difficult and valuable races, and you basically just do this until you are filthy rich and nobody can stop you. And not only are there legitimately like 50 planes that you can purchase and upgrade here, the game has permit races similar to Gran Turismo's license challenges, it's got a bunch of time trials, reverse knife versions of tracks that you can unlock, doubling the game's total track count from 14 to 28, and if you beat all the championships in a specific class, you then unlock these ultra hard challenge races, which pretty much require you to abuse as many shortcuts as you can to win. It's legitimately one of the most content rich racers on the console, not quite Gran Turismo of course, but surprisingly close. I mean look at this achievement list for N-Gen mode, there is so much stuff to do. 
So when you break it all down, engine racing isn't just a very unique racing game concept that's executed surprisingly well, it's also swimming with content. Now this leads us to maybe my only real problem with the game, and that's the presentation. You may have noticed the tracks in this game look a little, uh... Well, they're a little rough. Unfortunately, I think given the nature of this title, the way you have to design tracks to cater to flight as well as the high speeds that you're traveling at, well, the environmental design certainly suffers because of this. Truthfully, between the game's 28 tracks, it is very hard to tell any of them apart from one another based on visuals alone. Almost everything is a different color mountain range, either during the day or at night. It's a strange case where I actually remember each of the tracks based on specific turns and track elements, rather than what it looks like, and I don't think I've played a racing game before where that's a thing that's happened to me. It's also not too uncommon to lose track of the track, I guess you could say, on the faster speeds. But this usually comes down to track knowledge more than anything, but there are times where I wish the track layout was a little bit more defined. Now, I'm not saying this game is ugly by any means. I actually think a lot of the graphical elements are quite good. This is a 2000 release after all, and it definitely has some of the hallmarks of later PS1 releases in terms of texture quality, how good the play models look, some of the lighting and particle effects are also really great too. It's just a case where I think the hardware itself is limiting to this game's concept. I think the devs did the best they could given the power of the console, but like, if this was a PS2 game for example, I think this could have blown people's minds. All being said though, the devs still managed to hit a rock solid 30 FPS throughout the gameplay, so there's not a single stutter to be found the whole way through, which you love to see. Now I bet you're wondering about the game's music since we have a European high speed racer with X wipeout devs making it. So I get the feeling you probably already know what it sounds like. Engine's OST has club bangers across the board, but not a weak track to be found. It's telling that my only complaint about the music is that I wish there was more. The game only has about 8 tracks which don't randomize as well as I'd like, meaning that you can oftentimes hear the same track two races in a row, but really it's a minor complaint for an overall great sounding game. Also, I just need to give a special shout out to the music that plays when you win a race. when you come second in the race. And also, when you win a championship. Oh, that's the stuff. Look, I'm not gonna lie, this is a genuine hidden gem on the console. It's certainly an odd and probably very niche racing game, but sometimes you feel games are almost made to cater to you personally, and engine racing is very much one of those games. It's a high-speed jet racer full of banging tunes and loaded with content. It's one of those games along the lines of F-Zero or Wipeout, where you can enter such hyper-focus, where the music and gameplay just blend together in your mind, and you don't even really know what you're playing. You're in the zone, so to speak, and this game definitely lets you enter your zone, that's for sure. And on top of that, it's just a really interesting and unique concept that rewards experimentation and skilled gameplay, but most importantly of all, it's just really fun. If you're in the camp that happens to enjoy both Wipeout and Ace Combat, you need to go out of your way to try this as soon as possible, and as for everybody else, if you're looking for a cool and unique take on a racing game, Definitely consider trying this one out.
that we will provide. Accused of necromancy, witchcraft in its darkest form. How do you plead? Guilty! The mask of the accused. May the mask of the accuser protect your soul from the evil which consumes you. Let your journey to salvation begin. Kicking off the second half of Volume 9's selection, we got Warriors of Might and Magic, which first made its way to the PS1 in December of the year 2000. So if the name didn't give it away, this game is part of the long-running Might and Magic series, a very popular and influential series of role-playing games, which first appeared on computers all the way back in 1986. Now, in spite of the series' long list of games, most of which stick to the traditional RPG format of the original, the only two I have ever played are actually spin-offs of the main series, them being the wonderful arcane classic Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, aka Fun Kicking Simulator 2006, and this really addictive DS puzzle title called Might and Magic Clash of Heroes. You can get this on the PC too, but trust me, the DS is the place to play it. But today we're going to be trying a brand new Might and Magic game, and you guessed it, it's another spin-off, and a pretty interesting one at that. So you remember Treaty-O, right? The company founded in 1991 by EA founder Trip Hawkins. They released a console that cost a lot of money and it uh, didn't do very well. Well, similarly to Sega, once Treaty-O called it quits in the hardware business, they actually stuck around as both a publishing and development house, mostly releasing games over on the PC, but developing and publishing quite a number of games on consoles as well. Some of these were ports of old Treaty-O exclusives and others almost feel like they were created with the goal of being forgotten about as quickly as possible, but they did have successes here and there, most notably with their Army Men series of games, a series which somehow got like 10 entries on the PS1 in the space of 2 or 3 years, but those games are a topic for another day. Undoubtedly though, the Tridio company's best decision during their post-console era was to purchase the developers behind the Might and Magic series, New World Computing, thus obtaining a reliable PC development team and in turn, also the rights to the Might and Magic series. So from 1996 to 2003, all Might and Magic games actually came from 3DO, which is kind of weird when you think about it, but sure look, here we are. So today's game, Warriors of Might and Magic, isn't just a spin-off of the core Might and Magic series. It's actually part of an entire spin-off series known by fans as the Arden series. This series is comprised of three games, Crusaders of Might and Magic, Warriors of Might and Magic, and the final entry, just called Shifters. Now, interestingly, there exists multiple versions of many of these games, and almost every single one is its own unique game. The first in the series, Crusaders, has a PC version and also a different PS1 version. The follow-up, Warriors of Might and Magic, has a PS2 version, a PS1 version, and also a Game Boy Color version. And check out this Game Boy music, by the way. The final game in the series, Shifters, on the other hand, only seen a release on the PS2 and also lets you morph into a genie, which is kind of fun. 
So why am I even telling you all this? Well, I spent a lot of time reading about it, so here's Warriors of Might and Magic on the PS1. Now, just for clarity, it is unfortunate that we're skipping over the first game in the series, especially since Crusaders is actually floating about in the viewer wheel, so maybe it will show up next. You never know. But the good news is Crusaders of Might and Magic didn't sell very well, so that means the original plan to make Crusaders of Might and Magic 2 was scrapped and a new game called Warriors of Might and Magic was whipped up instead, featuring a whole new story with brand new characters, but set in the same universe. So thankfully, we ain't missing much. The story of this game centers on a character called Alaron, who has wrongfully been accused of being a necromancer. Of course, back in those days, people could just gang up on you for the crack, so there's nothing you can really do about that now, can you? As punishment for his crimes, he is branded with a weird living mask of shame that attaches itself to our hero, and he's dropped into a big pit, which you'd expect would kill him, but thankfully he lands on a box and is in fact completely fine. So the rest of the game is pretty much you trying to fight your way out of this dungeon that you find yourself in, and also trying to get rid of this mask and maybe even save the world, who knows. There's some nice cutscenes and voiced in-game segments throughout the game, but truthfully I'd say the story plays a minor role in the grand scheme of things. It takes up maybe 5 or 10 minutes of the runtime total and is full of weird plot twists and inconsistencies that both make it seem very rushed and a little nonsensical at times. Although the voice acting is pretty funny, so it's probably worth keeping up with these all the same. It's a disaster for me. It's time I took matters into my own hands. But how? What Warriors of Might and Magic is really all about is the gameplay itself, where we take our hero Alaron through 11 levels of dungeons, magic, fierce beasts, and also a bunch of platforming, cause why not? Each level is broken up into different locations, usually with the goal of making it from point A to point B, with a little time to explore off the beaten path for secrets and also plenty of combat. Control-wise, your character actually has full analog movement, so getting around feels pretty good. Although, let's take a moment to appreciate this guy's run cycle. Now this is a guy who's got some place to be, let me tell you. As for your character's moveset, well, things are kept relatively simple. You've got a button for jumping, a button to lock onto enemies, which also highlights the selected enemy's health, a basic tree hit combo, the only combo in the game actually, and also a button to use magic. Now throughout the game, you will get a variety of different weapons and magic, and those can be cycled through while using the L1 and R1 buttons. You get a total of three hand-to-hand -hand weapons, either a sword, axe, or hammer, that seem to get new upgrades almost every single level, so throughout the game, you'll likely just cycle from weapon to weapon each time you get a new upgrade. It's the same tree hit combo either way, so it doesn't really matter. Magic, on the other hand, is a bit more interesting. You'll collect various spells throughout the game, either through natural progression or as rewards for exploring or finding chests. Each time you find a magic spell, it starts off on level 1, but each time you find another copy of that spell, you can then upgrade it to a maximum of level 4. Spells include a crossbow, fireballs, lightning, freeze circle, holy circle, healing, shield. There's quite a lot, and while some are definitely more useful than others, seeing how OP some of these spells can be at their max level, it definitely makes exploring off the beaten path very, very much worth your while. Rounding out the controls, we also got the game's camera, which is mapped to the L2 and R2 button, allowing you to easily circle the camera around your character. Now, I could see some people finding this camera a little bit awkward, but as somebody who's played way too many games with this camera setup recently, I thought this thing was actually pretty decent. Certainly not perfect, but decent. It also lets you do this though, so yeah, 10 out of 10. And last but not least, you can also press both buttons together to aim in first person, which you'll definitely need for a few enemies and puzzles. So as you can see, it's definitely more of an action-heavy title than an RPG-heavy title. There's no menus or stats. The only real RPG elements come from leveling up and collecting new gear, but this stuff just happens naturally by progressing in the game, so you barely even notice it. Truthfully, the combat actually feels very brawlery. Is that a word? Brawlery? Well, anyway, if somebody was to tell me this was a 3D Golden Axe game, I would believe him. Combat magic is very simple, but it is simple and satisfying. Whack bad guy with hammer, hit bad guy with chain lightning, you lock on, tap a few buttons, and you're having a good time. Now, is the combat a little repetitive? Truthfully, yeah, but the enemy variety changes often, you're constantly getting new weapons and magic each and every new level. The gameplay itself rarely changes, but getting new abilities and seeing the visual updates to your character makes you feel like you're always accomplishing something and getting stronger. A nice, pleasant gameplay loop, if you will. 
Although while I enjoy the combat, there is some notable issues that are worth highlighting, most clearly the lack of a dodge or block button, meaning combat always boils down to one tactic, hit the enemy to stun lock them, and if that doesn't work, wait for them to attack, run away, and then come back and attack. This works on every enemy, every boss, throw in a bit of magic here and there, and that's the majority of the game. I would try a different tactic, but the game doesn't really allow anything but this, and while I can forgive the basic enemies for this simple gameplay, almost every boss, with the exception of a few highlights, boil down to using the same tactic too, which is quite the shame. Although, there is more to this game than just combat. You'll spend a lot of time exploring dungeons, fortresses, monasteries, all that medieval good stuff. The game has a dark, almost claustrophobic design to everything. It actually reminded me a lot of Quake, a much smaller, more narrow Quake, but haunting and oppressive all the same. I quite like it. While the levels do have a few branching paths and secrets to find, they are generally very linear affairs, mostly a series of corridors and connecting rooms, and if one path is blocked, the other path is usually the only way you can go. While exploring, you may also find some items laying about. Now, we've already mentioned weapons and magic, but you can also find health and mana pickups, which unexpectedly refill your health and mana bars. But there's also these other items, each of which are used to progress throughout the level. Gems, which let you open doors, orbs, which let you use teleporters, and keys, which are used for opening chests. These can spawn from enemies, environmental objects, chests, pretty much anything really. As long as you're killing, smashing, and opening everything that you find, you should never find yourself lacking in weird collectibles. The only thing left to cover, really, is the platforming, which, thanks to the game's nice analog movement, is actually pretty decent. All you've got is a single jump, and the majority of the platforming in this game is both rather easy and quite forgiving, but even when the tougher stuff and instant death pits begin to show up, it's, uh, yeah, it's honestly not that bad. So, for gameplay, I think we've covered all we need to know on that front, which means now it's time to talk about the presentation, and this is where things get a bit interesting. Now, you might have noticed the game's performance is a bit, uh... Well, it's, it's a bit rough. Now, full disclosure, I'm playing these games using an emulator, Duck Station to be exact. Now, this is due to personal circumstances and also convenience, truthfully, but while I try to present these games without any enhancements so they're at least a close representation of what you'd get on your very own PlayStation at home, in some very rare cases, PS1 games just don't play nice with emulators. One such example is the game Monkey Hero. I don't know if anybody really wants to play this, but emulating it is a bad, bad time. And as luck would have it, two other games that have this issue are Warriors of Might and Magic and its predecessor, Crusaders of Might and Magic. Now, these games share the same engine, and for whatever reason, this engine brings emulators to its knees. The game has these sharp bouts of extreme slowdown that render the game almost unplayable on most emulators. It even happens if you pop the games into a PS3, so... Even Sony's own emulator can't hack it. Now, thankfully, while Duck Station does experience slowdown, it is significantly less than other emulators, and the game is still very playable. But please note, on an actual PlayStation, this game runs at a pretty stable 30 FPS with the odd drop to the 20s. What you see here? This is much worse. I am sorry that I can't present the real deal, but hey, it's better than nothing. Now, is the game so graphically impressive that it warrants this lag? Uh, no, not really, but it is a pretty nice looking game in my opinion. Sure, some of the models can look a little bit goofy, especially up close, but the textures are really nice, the enemy models can be pretty fun, and in spite of the game's very muted colour palette, I think it helps give the game that dark, oppressive vibe that blends well with the cramped level design. At least the weapons and magic effects add a nice dash of colour to the game and even show off some nice lighting effects too. All in all, a nice looking game, as you'd expect from a late release on the system. The CGI is also pretty nice too, a little goofy at times, as is most CGI from this era, but it is a good effort and well put together for what it is. The music and sound on the other hand, I don't think I've played a game where I could say the music is both simultaneously really good and terrible at the same time. For the good, well, the levels in this game either feature no music or very subtle atmospheric tracks, once again reminding me of some of Quake's quieter and more tense moments. It's surprisingly good.
On the other hand though, the rest of the music and sound effects in this game were clearly taken from a random sample CD of generic movie and TV sound effects, which are not only really low quality, but tonally very out of place and oftentimes unintentionally hilarious. So yeah, that's the PS1 version of Warriors of Might and Magic, a deceptively simple title that's both a pretty easy game and not all that long, taking roughly 3-4 to four hours to be. But truthfully, I played through this whole game in one sitting and I had a pretty good time from start to finish. It wasn't going to set the world on fire in the year 2000 and it's certainly not going to set the world on fire now. But if you're a Might and Magic fan or enjoy 3D action platformers, this is actually a pretty decent option on the console. If anything, it really made me want to try the rest of the games in the series, and after trying a little bit of Crusaders, I can already tell there's some significant differences to these games, but I'm sure we'll get to that some other time. For now at least, if you want to play a PlayStation game about a masked man who's always got some place to be, Warriors of Might and Magic is the way to go. Whoa! Thanks! I owe you! Okay, bird. Help me get this mask off. Not this bird! You'll need to visit the Monastery of Enroth! What the...? Colin said he'd help! Not that he'd do it! Fine, so how do I get to this Monastery, Carlin? You want to take this path through the C-A-N-Y-O-N! Canyon? Why do you say it like that? It's filled with blood-sucking B-A-T-S's! Bats? I hate bats. It's better than taking the S-W-A-M-P path! How so? Blood-sucking pythons! There wouldn't be a third, safer path, would there? Nope. I'd recommend the canyon. Hurry, it's getting dark! And bats love the dark! Bats? Why did it have to be bats? You will provide... So uh, here's our viewer selection for this episode, a little game called Tunguska Legend of Faith. And if you know how the viewer selection on this series usually goes, you won't be surprised to find out it's a PAL exclusive, which made its way to the PlayStation in the year 2000, courtesy of German developer Exordus Incorporated. This game was chosen for the wheel by Grim Zane. Grim. Come on buddy, how could you do this to me? So Tunguska is a game I've never played before, but it is a game I'm very well aware of. I've seen plenty of clips of this game in motion and I don't think it takes a trained expert to know something is a little bit off with this thing. It also doesn't help that it often gets referenced as one of the worst PS1 games ever made. So as you can tell my viewers, they sure love to pick the classics. So we begin Tunguska with a cutscene highlighting a prisoner on death row who's being brought to an electric chair. Once the deed is done, we then see a prison guard morph into some sort of demon while our spirit leaves our body. We then get some flashbacks of a woman being murdered with what seems like a gun and there's also some religious imagery before we wander into a portal and then the game just kind of begins. There's no main menu, no options, you're pretty much straight into the game. Now you may wonder what all of that just was, and from what I can gather, this is Jack, our player character. Jack was a member of a suicidal cult 
a cult which he recently escaped from. But would you believe it, the cult ended up dying in a fire just after he left, killing all the members including Jack's wife. This has unfortunately led to Jack being accused of mass murder, hence why he's here on death row. Now as for the demons and everything else going on, this apparently might be the real killer and it somehow relates to Jack dealing with the demons inside his head, so He's teleported to a location known as the Castle of the Order of Tunguska, where he has to solve the mystery of the castle so he can find out the truth about what really happened. So that's about it for the story. Now we will get to more of it later, and by later I mean the very, very end of the game, as there is no dialogue or text anywhere in between. Once we're in the game, well, Tunguska is quite an interesting beast, because while you can probably detect the whole tank control static background shtick from a mile off, Tunguska actually represents a very unique style of game. It's an adventure game crossed with a fighting game. If somebody was to say it's Mist meets Virtua Fighter, well, then they actually wouldn't be too far off. The goal is essentially to escape from this big medieval castle that you found yourself in. This will require you to wander around, collecting items, solving puzzles, all the adventure stuff you know and love, but in between all of that, you'll also have to engage in 1v1 fights against various opponents, all utilizing a different array of moves and weaponry. Truthfully on paper, I actually quite like what the game is going for with this. It's certainly a unique concept, but if it's done well, I could see it being a lot of fun. Of course, it's probably no surprise that the game doesn't do either of these things very well. In fact, you might say, They've both been done quite poorly. But before we get into those aspects of the game, we should probably start with the controls because they are certainly something. So walking around using the D-pad, it's your basic tank controls you know and love. Holding down the X button initiates a run, which you'll likely use all the time. And also if you hold it down while standing still, you can run on the spot, which is kind of funny. If you hold down the circle button and press up on the D-pad, you can jump a very, very short distance. This had me worry that there might be platforming in the game, but good news, there isn't, and this jump button is entirely useless. That's pretty much it for basic movement, but combat is where things start to get really weird. So whenever you press square, you'll enter into a combat stance. This locks you onto your enemies, but it also changes how your movement works. Up and down on the D-pad moves you forward and back, but left and right on the D-pad now represent two different attacks. If you hold down the X button, the D-pad gets modified into four new attacks, and if you hold down the circle button, you now gain defensive abilities like sidestepping and blocking. The idea is to use a combination of D-pad inputs while holding down various buttons to unleash combos and different attacks on enemies. Now, admittedly, this is kind of terrible, right? But let's just say you've played another janky PAL exclusive PS1 game with tank control, static backgrounds, and a D-pad orientated hand-to-hand -hand combat system. Well, in that case, you might actually get accustomed to Tunguska's combat quite quickly. And if I'm being honest, the combat here is significantly better than what I've seen in Men in Black. It's unusual, yes, it's awkward, yes, but it's not the worst thing in the world. Throughout the game, you can even acquire new weapons like some nunchucks made of bones or a samurai sword, each of which also include a new list of moves to perform. It's not half bad, honestly. The thing is though, the game is designed in such a way that even if you like this combat system, there is no way for you to actually enjoy it. Almost every enemy in this game will beat the crap out of you unless you are using cheap moves. Give it a bit too much space, try to use a cool 1-2 combo, you're gonna be punished for it. Repeat the same simple move over and over again or abuse their animations with lunge attacks, Nobody in this game will give you any trouble. I wanted to try out cool stuff, but it just never works. The way the AI behaves promotes you being cheap. Anything else, you'll be punished quite quickly. Now, thankfully, in spite of the fact enemies can kill you in like one or two hits, dying in this game has pretty much no penalty whatsoever. When you die, you'll immediately respawn at the last door you came through, almost like a quick save. And since most enemies are right beside the entrance that you've just came through, Dying rarely loses you any time. Now this doesn't make up for the fights being really dumb and a case of who can stun lock the other first, but at the very least they're never rage inducing, just really dumb and boring. That goes for every fight in the game by the way. There are plenty of different enemies from humans to zombies to uh, whatever these things are, but outside of getting the new weapons, almost every enemy and fight in the game feels the exact same as the last. And when this is half of your game, well, we're not off to a great start. And if you can believe it, the fighting is, in my opinion, the better half of this game because the exploration and puzzle solving is where things really get rough. 
As mentioned, this castle and its grounds are the only location in the game. It's a big mess of identical corridors and rooms that are very easy to get lost in initially, but at the same time, it's also surprisingly small when you eventually get your head around it. Since there's no dialogue or even text in this game, there's no lore or story to dig into. It's just explore, find items, try to use said items on different things, and then eventually get out of the castle. When it comes to puzzles, the game has only one. Drag item onto the thing, and if it works, good job. A lot of this is pretty self-explanatory. Try keys on locked doors, put marbles in a the marble shaped area but there's also some real adventure game nonsense here too where you seemingly put random items in random places and things just happen to work out for you seriously you've got to try every item you've got just in case it doesn't matter if it seems like it's the wrong item try it anyway you never know there's even a part where you find a literal needle in a haystack at one point so yeah good luck with that now the adventure part of the game is quite bad and will take up most of your time, but what makes it even worse is also the game's very grainy visuals. Now the castle is okay, I do kinda like it in a way. Yes, there's a lot of copy pasted hallways and rooms, but it's definitely got a vibe going on. I also quite like the way the screens transition from one to another, it's a nice little effect they've got going on. But the low resolution of the images both makes navigation very difficult, but also trying to interact with items in the background. Now there is a little yellow dot on your hood that lights up whenever you can interact with something, but look at the specific angle you need to be in for it to show up. It is very easy to just miss something in a room because you didn't check every last square inch, and the grainy visuals often make you second guess everything you see. It's arguably even worse when you do eventually interact with something. Seriously, can any of you guess the item you're meant to use on this thing? Yeah, it's the ring. Why wouldn't it be? So the core of this game is janky fights that you need to cheese and backtracking all over a castle in search of items. So, sounds fun, right? Well, get this. We haven't even got to the best part. The traps. So throughout the game, you're going to come across these traps that you need to dodge. Now, sometimes killing an enemy nearby disarms a trap, but other times you'll need to navigate by them. Now, the traps in this game, I'm going to say, they haven't been tuned properly. There are ones that require almost perfect timing, which is a bit rough, but hey, at least I can get by them eventually. But there's also traps that you literally can't avoid taking damage from. Now, I've watched speedruns of this game, even they're getting hit all the time. The final type of trap, uh, I guess the devs just forgot to activate some of these. This happens quite frequently throughout the game, by the way, and it's very, very unusual. Let's just put it that way. Also, to make the game seem even more unfinished, there is no music in this game whatsoever. Just weird sound effects from enemies. Very, very weird sound effects. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm lying, there is one short music loop that plays whenever you do something of note, so naturally you'll hear it, and only it, about a hundred times during your playthrough. So that's about all there is to Tunguska. It's quite the mess, if I'm putting it lightly, and surprisingly, it's also rather short too. I'd say most people could fumble their way through this one on their first try in little over an hour, and the one thing that kept me motivated the entire way through was to find out how the story was going to end, keeping in mind we've had no story progression since the opening cutscene. So at the end of the game, as we finally begin to escape the castle, I was wondering if we'd fight a boss or anything cool, but Here's what happens. So you get to this gate, you open it, and you fight a skeleton. Then you reach another gate, you open it, and you fight a skeleton. Then you reach another gate, you open it, and fight a skeleton. Then you reach another gate, you open it, and fight a skeleton. Then you open another gate, you see this guy, and then the ending plays. What the hell was that? 
This was truly one of the most perplexing gaming experiences I've ever had. Nobody on this planet knows what's happening in this. Is it an allegory for death or guilt or religion? I doubt even the devs truly know. So look, there's no denying Tunguska is a bad game, right? I mean, that's clear to see, but so much of this thing just doesn't make any sense. And I'm not talking about just the story, but the map layout, the broken traps, the lack of music, something must have happened, right? Well, as it turns out, like most janky PAL PS1 games, Tunguska is actually a port of a PC game that was originally released in 1998. Now, footage of this PC version is actually quite rare, but lucky for us, somebody uploaded a playthrough this year, and I gotta say, it looks significantly better than the PS1 version. The backgrounds look great, the traps seem to work properly, the game even has music now. Now, I'm not saying these things will fix a lot of the game's major issues, but this is clearly light years ahead of the PS1 version. And after doing a little research, it seems the PS1 version doesn't just feature a significant graphical downgrade, but alterations to the map to save space, meaning more identical locations, and yes, also traps that haven't been tuned for console play meaning they are much harder to dodge than they should be. So yeah, it turns out we were actually getting screwed all along. So jury's out on the PC version of Tunguska, but one thing is for sure, the PS1 port is very, very bad. I'd almost even say it's charmingly bad. There's practically nothing good about this game, but at the very least, it did make me laugh a lot. And with instant checkpoints and the ability to save wherever you like, it at least was never frustrating, just very weird and very dull. Personally, I wouldn't call it the worst game on the console. It's not even the worst game I've played on this series, if I'm being honest. But regardless, it's definitely a game I wouldn't recommend. And seeing as it's a game with bone nunchucks, that is truly quite the shame. <laughs> So that was volume 9, without a doubt the wildest mix of games we've had yet, but I'm sure it made for a good episode at least. Well at least I hope so. We got to journey through the wild west with everybody's favourite French speaking cowboy, reach max speed in one of the fastest and most unique racing games on the console, electrocute a whole lot of creatures in a dungeon somewhere just for funsies, and try out a game with the best running on the spot animation I've ever seen. Now, as always, we need to slot each game into one of four categories. Is the game a must play? Is it something worth trying if you like the look of it? Is the game just kinda meh? Or is the game trash and not worth your time? Well, Volume 9's entry sees Tunguska winding up in the trash pile, Lucky Luke verging just on the edge of meh for me, Warriors of Might and Magic slotting in nicely into the tri-tier, and Engine Racing rounding things out as a must play, making this the first episode to feature a game in every single category. Now that's diversity. Tunguska, to the surprise of nobody, ends up in the trash tier. Nobody in their right mind could ever argue this is a good experience, at least on the PlayStation anyway. I will say on a personal level, I enjoyed this more than I thought I would. I've played many bad games that felt like a legitimate struggle to get through, but this one was mostly just perplexing and also very unfinished, and maybe the fact that it lasts like an hour made it a bit more bearable too. But either way, don't waste your money on this one. You got to watch me suffer through it for free instead, and frankly, that's much better value. Now putting Lucky Luke into the meh tier might come off a little harsh. There's definitely a lot to like about the game, but the parts that I didn't like, I really didn't like. And truthfully, the game definitely feels like it's aged a bit worse than other PS1 games of its type. Like I said before, if you like the character and the setting, you'll probably get something out of this one. But if not, there are countless better platformers you could be playing instead. Plus, I want to spare you guys the pain of the minecart section. Seriously, that was made by Sadist. Warriors of Might and Magic is in many ways the perfect C-tier PlayStation game. Nothing it does is truly exceptional in any way, but almost every aspect of the game, from the story to the combat to the platforming, is fun enough to keep you going from start to finish. Add in some nice graphics, atmospheric music and environments, and even a few hiccups and dodgy emulation issues couldn't stop me from having a nice time with this action RPG. Definitely one worth considering. 
And as for NGen Racing, I said it before and I'll say it again. This is a prime example of a hidden gem on the console. A unique take on an established genre that blends flight, combat and racing together at super high speeds. And not only is the gameplay great, but it's one of the most content rich racing games on the platform. Yes, it won't be for everybody, but if you are a fan of racing games, flying games or even just banging tunes, this one is a must play in my book and definitely a game worth seeking out for your collection. Now before we finish up I have to give a special thanks to Grim Zane for your submission to the viewer wheel. I'm starting to think the viewer wheel has a bad pal fetish but hey we don't kink shame here. Anyway if you'd like to spare me from bad pal games in the future feel free to drop an obscure and forgotten game of your choosing into the comments and I'll get it added for future volumes of the series. Also that means the next volume is going to be number 10 and even though there's probably going to be a few videos before then you know I've got something special planned for the big 1-0 so I hope you stick around until then. As always a very big thank you to everybody out there who watches the videos. I hope you're all keeping happy and healthy and I'll see you guys real soon for some more PS1 goodness but until then take care of yourself and don't forget to praise the wheel.